Good afternoon and welcome to today's Angry Bulletin. Leading the news today, we have a shocking revelation from NASA about Boeing Starliner. Apparently, in spite of the fact that we were told many times over that the most re recent flight test of the Starliner back in 2022 went fantastically. As a matter of fact, Boeing gave themselves an A-plus on the test well, it appears that Starliner is not as flawless as we may have been led to believe. NASA now is advocating a full-fledged and deep investigation of the program and the troubled vehicle before human beings can actually fly on it. How many more things need to go wrong with this troubled capsule before NASA finally shuts the project down? And in other news, after a two-year absence from the skies, Virgin Galactic finally takes to flight again and manages to reach space, at least the United States and the U.S. Air Force's definition of space, not necessarily the worldwide definition, but still manages to get to space, at least as far as I'm concerned, and does so flawlessly, or at least so we are told. So what's next for Virgin Galactic? Are they finally going to start putting some revenue on the books? All this and more coming to you on The Angry Astronaut right now. Good afternoon and thank you for joining us here on The Angry Astronaut. Just a quick update on my GoFundMe page. I'm going to stop talking about that for the next couple of weeks because I have achieved my short-term goal, as I've mentioned a couple of times before, of about 30% of the total amount that I was asking for, and that was what was necessary in order to get my living arrangements and such established ahead of time on the other side of the Atlantic. Thank you so much for your generosity generosity. The long-term objective of this GoFundMe page is something that we can take a little bit more time on, but if it's something you would like to contribute, frankly, if only one and a half percent of my European subscribers were to contribute either five euros or five pounds to this cause, that's something that would easily get me over my goal for the GoFundMe page. But in the meantime, let's get on with the news today. You know, I'm starting to get a little envious of Beth Moses, who is the flight and astronaut instructor for Virgin Galactic. This is actually her third time to suborbital space. And yeah, I know a lot of people are going to say, they didn't make me get past the Carmen line, it doesn't count, blah, blah, blah. Well, as far as the U.S. Air Force is concerned, and as far as the United States and NASA are concerned, they made it to space. And yeah, I may support Europe European space flight a lot and respect it and everybody's space flight but hey we were the first ones on the moon so I think we deserve a little bit of latitude when it comes to <laughs> latitude I, I didn't even mean to say that um, when it comes to determining what space is and what it is not in any event the Virgin Galactic flight which I reported could not experience an anomaly which had to have a successful flight well as you can see it managed to reach a peak altitude of 54.2 miles and once again as far as the U.S. Air Force con is concerned 50 miles is suborbital space. The mission began at 11.15 a.m. when the carrier aircraft EVE took off from Spaceport America and New Mexico with VSS Unity anchored between the carrier craft's two fuselages. And Unity came back down to Earth at 12.37 p.m., touching down on a runway at Spaceport America, EVE following shortly thereafter, bringing to an end the Unity 25 mission, that is to say, the 25th time that this spacecraft is flown, although many of those flights have been glide tests. Now comes the commercial flights, assuming everything actually did go right with this flight, and it appears that everything did go very well. Now, the commercial flights are not going to pull in enough revenue to get Virgin Galactic to a profitable state of affairs, at least not yet. They're going to have to have their fleet of new Delta-class space planes enter service, and these will be capable of 
flying once per week, thus allowing Virgin Galactic to conduct daily space flights. Once they're able to do that, Virgin Galactic could gross as much as a billion dollars a year, but in the meantime, their finances are going to be a tough thing to maintain. They're losing as much as $500 million a year with only about $900 million worth of cash on hand. If Virgin Galactic does not receive any further funding, they could be out of money in less than two years. Of course, if they demonstrate that they're able to put revenue on the books with a number of commercial space flights, I think that revenue could very well be forthcoming from investors. But if they experience so much as one spaceport Cornwall-like anomaly, that could put them in a very serious state indeed. We'll be keeping a close eye on these things. In the meantime, let's move on to Boeing. What's in the present is everything that took place during this mission that NASA seems to be ignoring right now. The whole use of the word excruciating, and I think that that was an appropriate word to use. For almost a full day, both Boeing and NASA went into a state of blackout. They wouldn't comment to the press at all as to how the mission was going, and people became very concerned that there were some significant problems with the spacecraft. To this day, we really don't know everything that transpired during that time frame. I think that all of the data that we gathered during that 24 hours is going to be very crucial to us determining whether or not this spacecraft is actually safe. But I think it's worth noting the number of times that Kathy leaders called the entire experience that 24 hours a learning experience and how much they actually learned during this process. What did they learn? Did they learn just how awesome this ship was? How flawless it was? I think not. I think that Starliner experienced a number of problems during this blackout that we haven't been informed on yet. And it is my sincere concern that hubris, the very thing that caused the Columbia and Challenger disasters, may again be rearing its ugly head at the National Aeronautics and Space Administration. So the reason I showed you that clip is not to say, ha ha, I was right, or anything like that. It's mostly to demonstrate that I am frequently accused of being sensationalistic about some of my claims in my videos, and I just wanted to make it very clear that I seldom make a claim that doesn't at least have some substantiation in fact. And after that 24-hour blackout, and after the numerous thruster failures, I was extremely suspicious of all of the really high marks that NASA was giving Boeing and that Boeing incidentally were giving themselves about that particular test flight. And at the time, numerous commenters were calling me biased, that SpaceX had had problems during its test flight as well, that my claims were sketchy and unsubstantiated, etc, etc. But I tend to be very suspicious of anything that doesn't smell right to me. And that whole test flight and everything that NASA and Boeing were saying about it smelled rotten. And unfortunately, Patricia Sanders, the chair of the Aerospace Safety Advisory Panel, confirmed my suspicions. Quote, there remains a long line of NASA processes still ahead to determine launch readiness. That should not be flown until safety risks can either be mitigated or accepted eyes wide open with an appropriate compelling technical rationale. It is imperative that NASA not succumb to pressure even unconsciously to get CFT launched without adequately addressing all of the remaining impediments to certification. Given the number of remaining challenges to certification of Starliner, we strongly encourage NASA to step back and take a measured look at the remaining body of work with respect to flying CFT, to take a deep look at the items on the path to closure. 
Sounds like that there are lots of remaining items on the docket that haven't been resolved even though nearly a year has passed since that last flight test. Sanders went on to say that in recognizing the importance of redundant U.S. crew transportation as a valuable goal, there should not be an impatience either in certifying the second provider until certification requirements can be achieved. While there is a projected launch date for CFT, this date represents an opportunity in the launch schedule, an ISS manifest, and not necessarily an acknowledgement of readiness to conduct that flight test. In fact, there are a number of open risks, some long-standing and some recently revealed through analysis of deliveries of certification verification products. Parachutes remain a pacing item for certification, integrated software testing is still ongoing, battery sidewall rupture risk has not yet been mitigated, although that risk has been accepted for the interim only, not for the long term. And in her final recommendation, Sanders said that there there should be an independent team conducting this deep look into the open technical issues related to Boeing Starliner's readiness. So this obviously wasn't about just thrusters or some sort of momentary problems in docking. There are ongoing problems with a number of Boeing Starliner systems, most significant of which, in my opinion, is the integrated software, something that has plagued this ship from the beginning. As I've said a number of times before, the very first video that I made for my channel was about Boeing Starliner and the problems that it was experiencing during its first test flight in 2019, and many of those problems were created by software, and the vast majority of the corrective actions that NASA recommended for Starliner at that time were in regards to software, and these problems apparently still linger. And here's another problem. The longer this takes, the more time that elapses before Boeing can finally start getting some revenue on the books with the first actual flights through NASA, the more in the red this project gets and the more willing Boeing is going to be to cut corners in order to finally get this thing off the ground. Frankly, at this point, I am convinced that Boeing would rather cancel the entire project. This is a millstone around their necks right now and something I think they would like to be separated from. And also, given the fact that Sierra Space is about three years away with their current funding from deploying a manned version of Dream Chaser, I think that we should seriously look at them as an alternative to finally cut this plagued program loose and go with what we should have gone with in the first place. An innovative solution that was radically different than the Crew Dragon or the Star liner solution that has the prospect of bringing amazing capabilities to NASA and really to the world in low Earth orbit. A solution that is months away from launching in a cargo capacity and as I said before, three years away from launching in a crewed capacity. That being the case then with additional funding from NASA, I think Sierra Space could come through with a far safer and less problem ridden solution in perhaps two years. And given the fact that Starliner is already running over three and a half years late from when it was supposed to be deployed in 2019, I really think this is the lesser of two evils. And consider just how bad the situation could have been if Crew Dragon had not proven to be such a stellar success. The Russians would have taken control of the ISS, or we would have been compelled to support Ukraine a lot less aggressively. How different the world might have been if SpaceX had not come through at such a crucial time. And I think it's time for us to go with another innovative company, Sierra Space, to solve this problem for NASA in the future and deliver the redundancy that we need need in low Earth orbit and for the remaining years of the International Space Station. Smash that like, hit that subscribe, please hit those notification bells as well, and as always, stay angry about space.